Praise the Lord. Thank you to those who have done a tremendous job leading us in worship this morning. As we turn our attention to the Word of God, if you join me in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your church. You are the head of the church. You love the church so much so you sent your son to give his life for the church, to include this very church. So we're thankful for it. And we pray that our worship thus far has brought honor to your name, that it has glorified you as you deserve. And I pray that our worship thus far has been a symbol of our lives bowed down before you, that our worship thus far has flowed from grateful hearts for all that you have done and all that you will do. As we open up your word now, as we meditate upon it, may your words work in our hearts. May our time meditating upon your word shape us. May it conform us into Christ's likeness. May it build us up into the church that you have called us to be. Give us the ears to hear your words. And Heavenly Father, I pray as the one with the task of preaching that I would be faithful to your words. And that if any of my thoughts or words slip in, may they fall to the floor, may they quickly be forgotten. May your words remain. May your words bear fruit in us. And we pray these things. Not in just any name, not in our own names, not in the name of our church. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. As I mentioned at the beginning of this service, I've received a, a lot of feedback in, regarding this series on revival. Yet, feedback is not what is needed. Rather, as we have discussed, prayer, repentance, obedience, and as we will discuss today, unity, those are needed. Those are the components that lead a church to revival. It's the human tendency in a series like this to look around. But the spirit-filled tendency is to look inside your own heart. So as we open up our Bibles, may we prepare ourselves to hear God's Word and look inside our own hearts, not out of selfishness, not out of a desire to put the spotlight on us. 
but may we read God's Word and look inside our own hearts so that God may work in us. As we conclude this series, as we look at the component of revival that is unity, I invite you to join me once again in Ezra chapter 10. Ezra chapter 10. Uh, we, we will narrow our focus a bit this morning. We will begin at verse 7 and read to verse 13. If you found yourself in our sanctuary this morning without a copy of God's Word and you'd like to hold an old-fashioned paper copy in your hand, feel free to make use of the Pew Bible somewhere in front of you. Ezra 10 is found on page 460 in that Pew Bible. If you do not have a copy of God's Word, feel free to take that Pew Bible home as a gift from us. Ezra chapter 10, uh, we've read it a number of times. Um, for those of you who have been here, it is my prayer that you remember the context. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here, I encourage you to go and find the recordings of previous sermons. Ezra chapter 10, verse 7, if you're ready for God's Word, can I hear a big loud amen? amen. Ezra 10, verse 7, a proclamation was then issued throughout Judah and Jerusalem for all the exiles to assemble in Jerusalem. Anyone who failed to appear within three days would forfeit all his property in accordance with the decision of the officials and elders, and would himself be expelled from the assembly of the exiles. Within the three days, all the men of Judah and Benjamin had gathered in Jerusalem, and on the twentieth day of the ninth month, all the people were sitting in the square before the house of God, greatly distressed by the occasion and because of the rain. Then Ezra the priest stood up and said to them, You have been unfaithful. You have married foreign women, adding to Israel's guilt. Now honor the Lord, the God of your ancestors, and do His will. Separate yourselves from the peoples around you and from your foreign wives. Verse 12, the whole assembly responded with a loud voice. You are right. We must do as you say. But there are many people here, and it is the rainy season, so we cannot stand it outside. Besides, this matter cannot be taken care of in a day or two, because we have sinned greatly in this thing. Amen to that portion of Ezra 10. In previous sermons, we've discussed this context. It's in Ezra 9 that Ezra returns to the rebuilt temple. And while he returns to the rebuilt temple, he, founds the, he finds the, the people of God once again in disarray. They have returned to familiar and destructive sins. And Ezra, seeing the condition of his people, he's heartbroken. And it leads him to fall down before God and cry out on behalf of his people. And as we've seen through this series, Ezra's broken heart and Ezra's prayer leads to more prayer, it, and it leads to repentance, it, it leads to obedience. The, the people see God's instructions, and even through great difficulty, they begin to match their lives to God's instructions. We, we see prayer, and we see repentance, and we see obedience. And this morning, I, I, I put the focus on unity. 
I, I encourage you to g go back and spend some moments with the passage we just read and, and, and make note of the unity. You'll see repeated references to all the people, to the entire assembly. Ezra stands up and says, you've been unfaithful. And in a unified voice, the people shout back, you are right. We've been discussing these components of, of revival. And when we read through the pages of Scripture, and we see revival take place like we see in Ezra 10, we see an abundance of unity. I want to talk about that a bit more this morning, so we will do a brief tour of a few New Testament passages that open our eyes a bit more to the component of revival that is unity. My first word for you this morning, Jesus prayed for unity in the church. If you've got a bulletin in front of you, you see that that point comes with a Scripture reference. If you could do me a favor, um, as we make each point this morning, you see a reference to a Scripture. Make note that it's there and return to it later. Um, I have a hard time getting through a sermon with one passage, trying to get us through before lunch with four is a task too tall for me to undertake. So note that the passage is there, but allow me to read it to you. Jesus prayed for unity in the church. Jesus' prayer from John 17, 20 through 23. These verses will be on the screen. Jesus praying for the church. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. That's a reference to the world. So my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. It might, ju just might, be the most overlooked prayer in our Bible, that Jesus prays for the church to be one. Jesus prays for the church to be unified. And you read this, and, and you have to believe that this is a prayer that he voices for every church on every street corner along with every church in the world that they would be one, a unified body. And he goes as far as to speak of the unity. Jesus praying speaks of the unity between he and the heavenly Father. He says, just, just like we are one, this is Jesus praying, just like we are one, the church should be one. Think about that that when the church is unified, the church displays the very character and nature of God. And if that wasn't enough, in Jesus' prayer, he takes it a bit further. He goes, the church unified is a depiction of, of, of me and you, our, our unity. And then he goes this a bit further, and he goes, how can the world 
know anything about a, a Savior unless they see a unified church. When the, the world sees a unified church, they'll, they'll know the Savior that sent out the church. It's quite a prayer. If we want the world to see a Savior, we must show them a unified church. How? How can we do that? If the church is filled with personal preferences and disagreements and division. I think Jesus shows us in this prayer that it's a pretty tall task. A pretty tall task to show the world the Savior when the church is a mess. So what must we do? <laughs> we, we, we must take our eyes off of the superficial and fix our eyes to something bigger, something eternal. Which brings me to my second point this morning. Unity should be a defining characteristic of the church. So if Jesus prayed for unity in the church, unity should be a defining characteristic in the church. I offer up to you Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. Again, these are on the screen for you. The Apostle Paul writes, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So the church should be unified, but unified in what? Unified in the truth of God and the truth of God revealed to us in our Bible. You've heard me say this before, that if we're doing this church thing correctly, if we're getting this right, this very room should be filled with all sorts of people. People with different backgrounds and upbringings, people with different bumps and bruises, people with different warts and scars, people with different triumphs and different defeats. But all united by a common Savior. Apostle Paul says, this, this is the truth, and this is the truth that unifies the church. We're unified by a common Savior in Jesus Christ, and once we enter this room, we open up a common Bible. So a moment ago, I, I spoke of unity, and we could hear such a statement, and we could swing in such, uh, such a degree that we, we wind up in a ditch. There are some that would call for unity at the sake of truth. Don't hear me say that when we should be unified that we are to overlook lies or falsehoods or outright heresy. It's actually the opposite. that we are unified by the common Savior that we have in Jesus Christ, 
in the common truth that we have revealed to us in our Bible. We don't get to make up a God of our own creation or our own imagination. We don't get to write the rules and instructions. We're brought together by a common Savior. And once in the room, we open up a common Bible. And as the Apostle Paul says, there's one body and one spirit and one hope. There, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Which brings me to my final point this morning. If you're still with me, can I hear an amen? amen. Unity sparks mission and revival. Unity sparks mission and revival. Could we do me a big favor just very quickly to make sure you're all still paying attention to me? Can, can we practice doing this? We're about to read one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture, which is very dangerous in doing it in the last point of a sermon, which so far is going perfectly according to the clock. Uh, so if I begin to wander here, feel free to give me one of these to say, Pastor Jeff, just wrap this up a bit. Um, well, while I'm there, is there somebody willing to just give me an extra five minutes? Okay, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 40, we should be good. Uh, unity sparks mission and revival from Acts 13, 1 through 3, a depiction, a snapshot of the church in Antioch, which became home base for the New Testament church in the early days. Now, in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, and then we get a list of names. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, and then we get a quote, quote, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them, end quote. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. This passage describes the leadership in the church in Antioch. I realize I read it quickly. I realize that might not be a familiar passage to you, but if you were to pay attention to those names, it's a diverse group. People that shouldn't have been in the same room together. People that shouldn't have been breaking bread together. But remember, as I said moments ago, if we're doing this church thing right, this place should be filled with people with all sorts of different backgrounds and upbringings, warts, scars, triumphs, defeats, but we're brought together by a common Savior. And here we see that in Antioch. And while they're worshiping, and we're, we're given two specific instances of their worship. They're, they're praying, they're fasting. And while they're in worship, the Holy Spirit spoke. But, but the Holy Spirit spoke with such clarity that the Holy Spirit's words are provided to us in quotation. Which is one thing, right, that the Holy Spirit spoke with such clarity, and then on, on the other hand, with such clarity and that the church was so unified that when it was said and done, everybody said, yeah, that's what the Holy Spirit said. The Holy Spirit speaks, and they continue to worship. They continue to pray. 
And they continue this fasting, and it ultimately leads the church in a unified voice and in a unified act, placing hands upon Barnabas and Saul and sending them out. And if you were to keep reading the remainder of Acts 13 and the entirety of Acts 14 is the unified church on mission. And Barnabas and, and Saul are doing the work for the remainder of Acts 13 and the entirety of Acts 14, and they finally get back. I, I guess the task is completed, and at the end of Acts 14, they come back to Antioch, and they share all that God had done. Because a unified church prayed and was obedient to what they heard. Could something similar happen here? Lord, let it be. Lord, let it be. Imagine with me. Imagine Sulphur Springs in Hopkins County, if the 2,205 members of this church walked in step with the Spirit. Imagine it, just for a moment. Imagine our own backyard if the 2,205 members of this church actually prayed and repented and were obedient and we acted as a unified body of Christ. I realize as I say that, it makes a great preaching point. Um, perhaps it's, it's too idealistic. So how about this? Give me a hundred. Give me a hundred. I'm just looking out at you guys today. It's a good attendance day, right? Um, there's well over 500 people sitting in this very room. Just give me a hundred people. Passionate. Committed. And obedient to the work of God. Perhaps some of you can be used by God to spark revival here. And when God moves, be ready. When God knocks on the door of your heart, allow him to sit upon the throne. When God knocks on the door of your home, allow him to rearrange the furniture. And when God knocks on the door of First Baptist Church, don't you dare say, we've never done it that way before. When God knocks on the door of First Baptist Church, don't you dare say, well, I'm content with the way things are right now. When God knocks on the door of this church, don't you dare say, I'm not ready for that kind of change. But rather, when God knocks in one unified voice, may we say yes and amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word that it still speaks, that it is still clear, that it is still loud. May we have the ears to hear it. May your words pierce through the noise in our lives. And Heavenly Father, as we have 
spent some moments in your word. We, we pray that our lives would match it, that our lives would bend towards your will, that this very church would be the church you have called us to be. And Heavenly Father, I, I pray for every person hearing the sound of my voice that we would passionately lay our lives down before you. That we would willingly throw our will aside for yours. May your will be done here in Hopkins County. May your will be done in this church. May your will be done in our living rooms and workplaces. May your will be done in our lives. Father, I pray on behalf of every person hearing my voice that you, in your grace and in your power, you would open our eyes, that you would reveal the ways in which we have been disobedient, ways in which we have been complacent or lukewarm. May we repent and may we obey. Father, I pray that you would also open our eyes up to the ways that we are getting it right, the ways in which we are being faithful, and you would give us strength and courage and perseverance. May you have your way in us and through us. And we pray these things. So thankful for your grace. We pray these things. So thankful that you hear our cries for help. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we conclude this